Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. You can turn in your Bible today to Matthew chapter 18. We'll pick up our study right where we left off last time, which was in uh, the area of chapter 18, verse 23. In fact, we did cover that, but I want to go back and begin reading at verse 23. As Jesus talks about forgiveness, not just our forgiveness before God, but our forgiveness toward one another and the uh, connection that's there between those two things. So get your Bible, if it's possible, so we can uh, study the Word of God together and you can look at your copy of Scripture. You can also study the Word of God with me at your pace, at your convenience, at the Bible verse by verse dot com. That's the Bible verse by verse dot com. Study the whole Bible using my audio Bible messages. Actually, study through the Bible three complete times, going verse by verse with me. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 18, let's begin reading in verse 23. Jesus says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king who would take account of his servants. In this story, the servants referred to governors. Governors, like today, were in charge of large sections of land in this man's kingdom. And uh, one of the jobs of the governors was to collect taxes from his area, and then pass that on to the king. 24. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him who owed him 10,000 talents. One of these uh, governors was not doing his job. He owed the king 10,000 talents in back taxes. You know what, you want to know how much that is? Over a billion dollars. This guy had not been doing his job for a long, long time. So he has a huge debt. And verse 25, But for as much as he had nothing with which to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The guy couldn't pay off the debt. Doesn't say what he did with the money. It doesn't matter. He was in debt way over his head. A thousand lifetimes. 200,000 lifetimes could not pay off this debt. So he was sold, his wife was sold, and their children. Okay, so that's, let's say they had 10 children, plus the husband and wife, that's 12 talents. Because if the top, the top price for any slave was one talent, that's top. So let's assume they all got top price. Big deal, 12 talents. He owed 10,000. Not even that would help him pay off this debt. He was in way over his head. And it says in verse 26, The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Not a chance. But he begs for mercy. Which is the only thing that he could do. Beg for mercy. It's 27. And the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. That is an amazing act of forgiveness. On the basis of the fact that this man was helpless and hopeless and humbled himself and asked for mercy, the king forgave him this debt that he could never repay. And this is a picture that Jesus is painting of you and I and our sin debt toward God. If you want to be forgiven, you have to understand that you can never pay your debt off. You're in way over your head. And the only thing left for you to do is fall down on your knees, humble yourself before God, and ask for mercy through the one Savior, Jesus Christ. And so notice that the king forgave him. And Jesus wants you to know that God will forgive you too. No matter how big your sin debt is, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what sins you've committed. Doesn't matter how many times you've committed them. 
If you humble yourself before God and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God will forgive your enormous sin debt. So move on here now to uh, verse 28. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. He went out and he, right after being forgiven, that enormous debt, he went out and he found. It's, it's as if he went out looking for people who owed him money. And he found this one who owed him a pretty good sum. 100 denarii would be 100 days wages, so over three months, that's, that's a pretty good chunk of money. Nowhere near what he had owed the king, but it's still a pretty good chunk of money. He didn't even give this guy a chance to, to, uh, to say, I got the money. He grabbed him by the throat and said, pay me. What an ungrateful, miserable, rotten, self-centered wretch. To do that to one of his servants after he had just been forgiven an enormous debt. I mean, he just is aggressive and goes after this guy. So look at verse 29. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me and I will pay thee all. If, if that sounds familiar to this uh, forgiven servant, it should because those are the exact same words that he spoke to the king. And it should, have, it should have reminded him of what he had said to the king. It also should have reminded him how the king had forgiven him that enormous sin debt. I should say that enormous debt. Did it? Well, let's look. Verse 30, And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. No forgiveness coming from this guy. No patience, no mercy, no forgiveness. Bang, you owe me and you're going to pay. And I don't want to hear about mercy because you're not getting it. You say, that's outrageous. This fella had just been forgiven a billion dollar debt because he humbled himself and he refuses to forgive the debt much lesser debt of somebody who humbles themselves before him. That's outrageous. That's disgusting. Yes, it is. What's our Lord's point? The subject is forgiveness. The point is this. It is unthinkable. It is wicked. It is horrible. It is outrageous. For you, as a Christian, who has been forgiven an enormous sin debt by God through Jesus Christ, had your slate wiped clean to then turn right around and refuse to forgive someone who has sinned against you after they have confessed and humbled themselves. Terrible thing. 31. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. So, this man's fellow governors, when they heard that he would not show mercy to this man who owed him three months' wages, when the other governors heard about that, they were outraged. And they went and they told the king that he wouldn't forgive. So look at verse 31. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou besoughtest me. You wicked, wicked servant. Why was he wicked? Because he wouldn't forgive after he had been forgiven. To those of you, and I know there's a lot of Christians out there who have unforgiveness in their heart who have an attitude of unforgiveness because before I started pastoring a church, I, I, I preached in several different churches, you know, just to fill in and, and just to be able to preach. This is many, many years ago. And I preached on this section of scripture on the subject of forgiveness. And I had more response 
after that message than I think any other. Without fail, after I got done preaching that message, no matter what church I was in, I would have people come up to me and say, Mike, God really spoke to me today through this message, and I need to forgive this person or that person. I've been wrong. And if you haven't forgiven someone after God has forgiven you, you are wicked, my friend. You are wicked. And when God says something, he means it. That's how he sees you. You say, well, not me, though, because I prayed the sinner's prayer and I've been forgiven. Yeah, just like this guy. And you are wicked. And that's not all. Look at verse 33. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Again, that governor had been shown an abundance of mercy and had been forgiven, but he refused to show mercy. And that's why the king called him wicked. It is a wicked thing in the eyes of Almighty God for a Christian who had been has been forgiven so much to hold a grudge against someone who has done something wrong to them. It is wicked in the sight of God for a Christian to be bitter and unforgiving towards someone who has sinned against them if they have confessed their sin. Now, there are some Christians who are so easily offended, it's not even a sin that offends them. Somebody just says something that rubs them the wrong way or does something that rubs them the wrong way. And it's not sin. But I've known Christians, professing Christians, I will add, who instantly become outraged over the smallest things. And you better not even try to ask forgiveness or you'll get nailed to the wall. Bitterness over nothing. Anger. Unforgiveness. And there's nothing really to forgive. But anger and bitterness over nothing. There's that problem with some Christians, so-called Christians. And then there's the other problem, which is similar to what's happening here, which is when a Christian does sin against them and they confess, but boy, you're not going to get forgiven by me. And God says, you are wicked. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? You think you're more important than God? You think you're more precious than God? It's fine to for, for God, Almighty God, All Holy God, to forgive you when you confess? But nobody better sin against you, boy. Because you're more important than God. God can give forgiveness, but you can't because you're that precious. Shame on you. I know people like that. I bet you do too. I hope you're not one of them. But if you are, you better repent because it's serious business. God says you're wicked. 34. I'll tell you how, how serious it is. Look at verse 34. And his Lord was angry and delivered him to the inquisitors till he should pay all that was due him. The governor had his forgiveness reversed. That's how serious it is. And he was forced to pay for his sin after being forgiven. And Jesus is talking about Christians. I have a suggestion for you. Do not go to your grave with unforgiveness on your soul. If you are a professing Christian, do not go to your grave with unforgiveness and bitterness on your soul. You better take care of that. I don't know exactly what awaits someone who refuses to forgive, but I don't have to know exactly what it is because I know it's not good, I know it's bad, and I know it involves pain for your sins. And uh, we all know what that means. 34. And his Lord was angry and delivered him to the inquisitors till he should pay all that was due him. 
your forgiveness is reversed. You want to go to your grave unforgiven? You want to go to your grave not right with God through Jesus Christ because your salvation, your forgiveness has been reversed because of your bitterness? That's what you want to do? 35, so likewise, you see, he's not talking about Christians. Oh, really? Yeah, my pastor says that's not talking about Christians. My pastor has got a degree in theology. So do I. Big deal. You better line your theology up with God. And you better line your, word, your theology up with Jesus Christ. Because if you don't, your theology is leading you astray. People like, and I love theology. I've said this before. I love theology. I, do, I mean, shortly after I was saved, I started reading thick, heavy, small print where I had to have an unabridged dictionary sitting next to me every morning. I had my Cheerios, and I would read seven pages of a theology work that the print was about the size of a phone book, if you remember those things from the old days. So I love theology. I took theology in Bible class. Man, I love theology. Bible college. So I like theology, but boy, oh boy, if what you've been taught in your theology or what you're teaching doesn't line up with Jesus, he's not changing, you better. And so it says, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. He is talking about Christians. That's what the point is. The point of this whole story is how one Christian professing Christian, should treat another Christian who has sinned against them and confessed. That's the point of this story. He is talking to Christians in this story. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. Who's the you? His people. If ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother his trespasses. The word brother indicates clearly that this is an issue between Christians. So what happened? The man in this story was sent to the torture chamber to pay for his sin of unforgiveness and his sins, all of his sins. Then Jesus says to Christians, the same thing is going to happen to you. If you die with bitterness, better not let it happen. Say, so we're saved by forgiving others? No. You're saved by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. But if you refuse to forgive someone, if you have bitterness and you refuse to forgive someone, that's an indicator that you're not saved and you're not forgiven. Because I'll tell you something, if you've been forgiven, you appreciate that. Well, unlike the person in the story, if you've been forgiven through Jesus Christ, you appreciate that. That means an awful lot to you and you love Jesus and you wouldn't dare think about being unforgiving and bitter towards others the moment you recognize it, and sometimes it's a sneaky sin, sometimes it sneaks in the back door of our soul without us recognizing it right away, but then we read something like this, and the Holy Spirit causes us to recognize, not recognize that sin we're, we're guilty of. And if you recognize that, repent of it, because it's an indicator that you're not saved. Because that's what he's talking about here. You will pay the torturers will make you pay for every last one of your sins and your forgiveness is reversed. And if that doesn't line up with your theology, like I said, then what Jesus just said here is crystal clear. And what he said is not the problem. What you believe is the problem. You better change your theology. Let's go into chapter 19. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, 
he departed from Galilee and came into the borders of Judea beyond the Jordan. Verse 2. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. So Jesus has concluded his ministry up north in Galilee, and so he heads south toward the area of Jerusalem. 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, testing him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? You know, the, the Pharisees are testing Jesus. They're trying to trap him, which would be laughable if it wasn't so hideously sinful. But they didn't like Jesus because they didn't like how he was so popular. They were jealous. Consequently, they figured that if they could get him to, com to commit to a position on divorce, he would ostracize at least half the population, no matter what his answer was here. Because divorce was a very divisive issue in that day. Uh, there were, you know, about half the people believed that you could be divorced for any reason. And, uh, and another half said, no, it's much stricter. It's just, you know, marital unfaithfulness. So you had those two camps. So they asked Jesus, what his position? Where, where do you come down on this argument? And, and they're so shrewd because they think no matter which he comes down on, no matter which side he comes down, he's going to ostracize the other half of the population. But I love Jesus' answer. Let's look at verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? What's the Bible say? Jesus always took people back to the Word of God. You got a question for me? What does the Bible say? Let's look at what God has to say about this issue. So he says, have ye not read that he, God, who made them at the beginning, made them, what? Male and female. Well, that's funny. That probably shocks a lot of people who are in the world today. God made them male and female. What about all the rest. What about those that are in between? As I had one guy say to me a while back, I'm in transition. There's no such thing as transition. You're screwed up. Your thinking is warped. There's no such thing as transition. If you're not sure what you are out of one of these two, then take off your clothes, stand before a full-length mirror, and write down what you see and send me what you see and I will give you the answer, okay? You're in transition. God made a male and female. He made a male and female. And then it says, Jesus says, in verse 5, and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall, be, and shall cleave to his wife and they too shall be one flesh. You know what Jesus is talking about here? The subject. Marriage and divorce. And first he hits on marriage. And he defines what marriage is. What is marriage? Well, number one, it's instituted by God. God invented marriage. And God says, when defining marriage, it is a man leaving his father and mother and being joined to his wife. A man and his wife, male and female, like he said in the previous verse. And so I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, states can legalize same-sex marriage if they want to, but they are playing a game of make-believe because the state does not marry anyone. God does. Marriage is a contract between a man, a woman, a male, a female, a contract between them and God. That's marriage. The states are playing a game of make-believe if they think they can issue a license for two men to be married or two women to be married 
and have it legal marriage. Well, it might be legal in the state, but it's nothing. You know what it amounts to? Between those people, an ongoing sin of fornication. That's what it is. God doesn't recognize it. The leader of the Southern Baptist Convention? Disgusting. Disgusting. He's so open. He's so, he's so soft. He's so wonderful. You got rocks and you got scrambled eggs for brains if you belong to that denomination because every cent that you give, it goes to the cooperative program. And it pays the salary of people like him who come out in favor of gay marriage, who don't believe in the Bible, who don't believe in the literal interpretation of the Bible, who don't believe that the Bible is without error. Some don't believe that Jesus is God. Some don't believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Some don't believe that Jesus is returning literally. Some don't believe that Jesus is the eternal God, but was a created being. Oh, there's a, there's a whole wide range of people. There are people who go to the Southern Baptist Convention, according to the president, who, are, who work at abortion clinics, who do abortions. Is anything said? No, of course not. That organization and that man could be the poster boy for modern evangelicalism, which I talk about so much, and now you know why. And if you get upset at me for talking about this, you're part of the problem. So, while they're talking about gay rights, his words, not mine, I would never use those words. There's nothing gay about the sin of sodomy which is what God calls it. States can legalize this sort of thing, but God does not recognize it. And God's plan for marriage has not changed. His plan is one woman, one man, till death do them part. Verse 6, Wherefore, they are no more one but two flesh, but I should say, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man Put asunder. That's God's standard. It's between one man, one woman forever, for as long as they live. Seven, they say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement to put her away? Well, and that's true, he did. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, God did allow for divorce. So look at Jesus' answer in eight. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Moses, Moses allowed for divorce. In other words, the word of God in the book of Deuteronomy allows for divorce. But it has to be a legal transaction. It has to be done. It can't just be done on a whim. Divorce was not what God had in mind for marriage. He allowed it because sometimes sin causes problems in marriage to the point where divorce becomes the lesser of two evils. And the law that God gave permitting divorce was meant to restrain hasty divorce by demanding sufficient cause and legal formalities. But it was never intended to promote divorce or to make it easy. We'll continue on in verse 9. I've got to stop right now, but you can continue studying the Word of God with me if you want to at the Bible, versebyverse.com. Using my audio Bible messages, you can study from Genesis through Revelation, three complete series, in-depth Bible, verse-by-verse -verse studies at the Bible, versebyverse.com. While you are there, please remember, I'm not underwritten by large church or denomination. This is a faith ministry, meaning you can go back and study those three complete series spanning over 30 years of teaching, and you will see I've never compromised the truth. I've always taught it clearly, simply, verse by verse. 
If you want to be a part of this ministry, pray for me, pray for the word. Click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. So long.